Welcome to this TMDL public meeting for Lake Aquabi. My name is Jeff Burkus. I'm the TMDL program lead for the Iowa DNR. We'll be joined in a few minutes by Jim Hallmark, who is the project lead for this TMDL. And I wanted to just start off this presentation by introducing a few concepts and making a couple of key notices that you would want to keep in mind as we work through this presentation or you work your way through the document that's available on our website. The first thing that we want to keep in mind is that we are in a public notice period for this document, this TMDL for Lake Aquabi, and that public notice is going to run through October 12th of this year, 2020. What that means is that if you, in reviewing this document online, you have come across something that you would like to make a comment on, you, you see an error or something that you think we should add into the document, you'll need to send that comment to me by October 12th to that email address that's listed there, uh, jeff.burkis at dnr.iowa.gov. If you had more general questions or wanted some clarity, those are the kinds of questions that you should direct to Jim, and his email address is james.hallmark at dnr.iowa.gov. And so that's, that's the first thing to keep in mind is the public notice date of October 12th. A couple of concepts that we want to talk about that are really important to try to understand what it is that we're talking about throughout the presentation and give you a head start into the document if you haven't started in on that. Uh, the first term is watershed. And to help us explain watershed, I've pulled a map that Jim's going to talk about a little bit more in depth later on uh, to help try to explain this. And so with this map, you see this red outline here and then the kind of this darker uh, shaded image in, inside of that red line. This red line is indicating the watershed for Lake Aquabi. And what that means is that all of the land contained within this red outline will eventually drain water to this lake. And the way the best way that I can think to think of this is that if you get a rainstorm that comes across and you get a raindrop that falls anywhere inside of this, uh, this dark red outline, it's going to eventually find its way into Lake Aquabi. If it falls outside of the red line, it's going to go to a different watershed. And so that's not necessarily what we're concerned with. We are most uh, concerned in this watershed with this land and everything associated with it that gets into Lake Aquabi. Another thing that I think is important anytime you see a map is take a, take a moment and try to understand what it is that map is trying to tell us. And so all of our maps will have a couple of things. It'll have a compass rose here, so it's pointing uh, you to the direction of north so you can get yourself oriented inside of the map. It's also going to have an inset map here of the state of Iowa with its 99 counties outlined here. And then the red and the shaded box is the county that we're in with Lake Aquabi. And then you'll have other things. Uh, this is a, a marker to show how, uh, how much distance there is uh, on the map. Uh, up here we have a legend. So again, that red outline indicates the watershed. Um, you know, Lake Aquabi is this, this shade of blue here, this sort of gold uh, brown type of outline with, with, uh, with the dark marks inside of it. That indicates public land, so that's the state park here for Lake Aquabi. So these are very valuable to, to help you read these maps, and I encourage you to take the time to do so every time that you look at a map, either in this presentation or again in the document online. This is another map that um, Jim's gonna talk about it more. So again, just to kind of show you how we use these things, uh, this red outline again, hey, we're in the same watershed. This is Lake Aquabi here. Um, but what, we're, what are we trying to show here? Well, let's look at the legend, and we're seeing a lot of different land use types. And so, uh, well, this one here, this green color, that's timber. Okay, so that's part of the park. Uh, here we have this, this uh, yellow and brown crosshatch that come over here. Okay, well, that was used for row crops. Okay, so, that, so you get an idea of, of what is happening in the land that's associated with this watershed. So that's really good information to know. And then you might see a map like this, which is a little bit zoomed in on the lake. But again, let's make sure that we understand where we're at. This red line still indicates the watershed, um, but we're a little closer because we wanna show something specific to the lake. And what we are showing in this particular map here is that we have an ambient monitoring site where we have this, uh, this, little, this little hatch here. 
And so that's the location of our monitoring sites. And so again, just kind of take your time every time you see a map to try to help understand what it is that we're trying to communicate there. And Jim will talk through all the maps that he shows as well. The next concept that I think is important for us to all be on the same page on is the term impairment. And so an easy way to think about that is that an impairment is just not meeting water quality expectations. And so we have these things called water quality standards in the state. And it's basically what we expect each water body to attain in terms of, uh, in, in terms of what, we, what we think that that watershed should attain. So um, for example, in Lake Aquabi, we have too much uh, algae in this lake. And so that's not meeting the expectation that we expect that lake to have. And so it's impaired. And so that goes on to the impaired waters list. And then our group comes in and tries to figure out what's going on with it. And we'll get into more details there. The next concept is point and non-point source pollution. And so the way to think about this is point source pollution is anything that is permitted to pollute inside of this watershed. We don't have any such instances of that for this particular watershed. And so we are actually most concerned with non-point, which is the opposite, which is anything that's not permitted that's a source of pollution in this watershed. Jim's gonna get into more specific details of what what that breaks down inside of this watershed. Um, but in general, we are talking about things that aren't coming out of a pipe and aren't permitted and something that may be running off of the land into a stream that eventually finds its way into Lake Aquabi. And then the next terminology that I think is really important, especially for this program, is what in the heck is a TMDL? I've, always, I've already used that word or that those combination of letters a few times. And so what is a TMDL? And for me, I really like to use this image here. So TMDL stands for total maximum daily load. And I like to think of it with this pack mule here. So uh, let me walk you through this. So imagine this pack mule at some point was just carrying around this cart with no boxes on it. And he's able to run around all day without any real issues because there's not a lot of weight on the cart. As we pack more boxes onto the back of that cart, it gets harder and harder for that pack mule to be able to do its job. Eventually, there's so many boxes packed onto this thing that it actually weighs more than this pack mule and he's flipped up in the air. Clearly, he can't do anything that he's supposed to do when he's up in the air. Now, imagine that that's the lake. Uh, the pack mule is the lake and the boxes here are boxes of pollutant. We have certain expectations for the lake and if we don't have any pollution in the lake, the lake's gonna be able to perform just fine. If we stack a couple of boxes of pollution inside of the lake, it's probably gonna be okay. It can handle a few boxes. But as we put more and more boxes on top of the cart or inside of the lake, it gets harder and harder for it to meet expectations. Eventually, we have some issues and it's just out of commission. And so our job here is to try to figure out how many boxes that we need to pull off of the cart or off the lake uh, to get this guy on the ground and be able to run around. And that's what Jim has done with this project and he's gonna go into in more detail. Now, one distinction that is important is the difference between total maximum daily load, which is a specific number that we calculate and what's called the water quality improvement plan. So the water quality improvement plan is the document that contains not only the total maximum daily load and all of the mathematical information uh, around how we calculated that, but the implementation plan, which is very useful for the next stage of any kind of water quality project, which is uh, delivering some ideas of what could be done on the ground in terms of implementation that could fix the problem. And so Jim will get into a little bit more detail there. But those two terms are pretty interchangeable in our, in our work, uh, TMDL or total maximum daily load and the water quality improvement plan. So if you were like, well, I see the water quality improvement plan on the website, but I don't see the TMDL. It's actually the same document, uh, but we uh, some, are sometimes a little loose with the terminology. And it's important to know that the TMDL actually refers to a specific number. I like to consider it the tipping point because we are trying to find that point where we can get that pack mule on the ground and be able to function. Um, and then that document itself is called the Water Quality Improvement Plan because it contains more than just that math information. It contains information about how to implement the plan. 
And the last thing that I wanted to do is just show one of the charts that Jim's going to be showing. And, and this is just kind of a general thought here, but anytime we see any kind of graphical representation, I think it's important to kind of slow down and make sure that you understand what Jim is, uh, is trying to convey here. And so when I look at a graph like this, I'm always looking at the axes here. What are these things telling me? So I see here along the bottom that this is year. So, okay, 20, 2007 and 2019. So this is a, a time frame that we're looking at here. And then TSI values. I'm going to let Jim explain exactly what that is, but that's, that's okay, we've got some sort of value that we're mapping. And then I've got different colors and shapes and that is up here in this key. And again, Jim's gonna explain all these to us. But just take your time, and if you don't get it the first time, it's not a big deal. That's the beauty of having this as a recorded presentation. Just rewind and let Jim explain it to you again, or if you're looking at the document online, uh, you know, do the same thing. See if you can kind of take your time and see what it is that we're trying to uh, explain with that particular craft. So just kind of a note there. And I will hand it over now to Jim Hallmark, who will lead us through what he found out during his investigation. Thanks, Jeff, for the introduction. Uh, as Jeff said, my name is Jim Hallmark, and I'm the project lead for this uh, water quality improvement plan for the Lake Aquabi watershed. I'm going to talk a little bit. I have an outline here of what I plan to talk about today. Uh, first of all is our water quality improvement plan and what are some of the elements in a water quality improvement plan. Included in that would be a, a description of Lake Aquabi and its watershed. Also uh, a water quality assessment. Um, how, how did we determine what the problems were and how, how do we resolve them? And then I'm going to talk about our TMDL development. Remember that Jeff mentioned that a TMDL is actually a number. So how did we actually come up with our number? And then the last thing is an implementation plan is what are some of the things that we can do uh, moving forward? So with our uh, water quality improvement plan, one of the first things that we, we do is we do uh, monitor and assess a water body. That would include sampling and, and doing an analysis from those samples. And next we put together a draft water in uh, water quality improvement plan, which is outlined is um, determine the pollutant sources, what our total maximum daily load is, and again an implementation plan, a, a list of potential solutions and, and practices to help uh, improve water quality improvement. Uh, water quality. Um, the next step that we do in a water quality improvement plan is we hold a public meeting. This includes this presentation that we're doing and as part of this we're going to ask for public comment and review of, of this plan. So feel free uh, to email or call Jeff or I with any comments or questions that you have. And, and the last thing that the water quality improvement plan includes is uh, um, encouragement for, for uh, local involvement. We have much better success when local uh, people are involved. Uh, implementation of, the other thing is implementation of strategies and practices, best management practices. And then uh, continued monitoring of a, of a water body to measure performance of any practices that we put in into place. So here is um, just kind of a, a talking in general about Lake Aquabi. Uh, Lake Aquabi is located in Warren County, just south of Indianola. And uh, Aquabi and, and much of its, uh, the park structures were constructed in the 1930s as part of the Civil Conservation Corps, which was uh, the 1930s was part of the Great Depression and so they put people to work uh, on government projects uh, to keep people working and, and busy. Um, and that was in the 1930s. Uh, the surface area of Lake Aquabi is, is approximately 116 acres uh, and a football field is roughly one acre. So a surface area is roughly 116 football fields with, with uh, a volume 
of the lake of 1,244 acres, acre feet. <clears throat> okay, so the Lake Aquabi watershed has a drainage area of approximately 3,288 acres. Uh, and is located with the, within the 787-acre Lake Aquabi State Park. You can see the state park outlined here. Here's Lake Aquabi. Um, this watershed contains several farm ponds and sedimentation basins that have been constructed over the years. And it, according to my count, I counted roughly 51 uh, sedimentation basins and farm ponds. As, as many of these are farm ponds just uh, owned by individual property owners. The largest of these is uh, Hooper Area Pond, which is roughly 33 acre, has a surface area of roughly 33 acres. Land use for uh, Lake Aquabi watershed is pretty evenly distributed between forest, land, row crop, and grassland. With with forest comprising 33% of the of the land use, uh, row crop is at 27%, and grassland is 29. Uh, grassland could include um, alfalfa and hay, uh, um, non non-pasture land is generally what it would include. But again, as you can see, it's a fairly even distribution between the forest row crop and grassland. Now the slope, we look a little bit about the topography and this, this can be important when we're talking about erosion within a watershed. Uh, but the, the slope distribution within the watershed shows that the average slope is 10% and 70% of the watershed has a slope greater than 5%. Now, in just in um, just for a comparison, if uh, you've driven through mountainous areas, you know, through the Rockies or the Cascade Range or uh, whatever uh, other mountainous areas, you, you'll typically start seeing road signs of uh, steep grades of 5%. Uh, posted to warn you that hey, you got a steep grade here, you know, and if you start at the top of the mountain, you don't put your foot on the gas. Eventually, as you go downhill, you're going to be, begin to pick up speed and get faster and faster unless you have some mechanism uh, to slow down or, or brake or the topography changes where you start to go back uphill or it flattens out where eventually you will slow down, lose energy and momentum. Um, and this can be uh, critical during uh, times of rain when, when erosion occurs. And we'll talk maybe just about it real a little bit later, why that, how, how we can overcome some of that uh, energy generated through the, the slopes and, and runoff. Okay, so an assessment of Lake, Lake Aquabi is what's, what, what's the problem with uh, Lake Aquabi? is that we have a couple issues. It's uh, clarity issues, which can be generated by algae or, or sediment, suspended solids in the, in the lake that uh, make it, that cause, um, you know, makes it difficult to see through the water. It just becomes less transparent. Um, and the second issue would be algae. Um, algae is a result of, uh, of nutrients, specifically nitrogen and, and phosphorus, um, but the algae itself can create clarity issues. So that's that's what's going on with Lake Aquabi is we just have uh, a lot of algae and, and, and sedimentation in the lake itself. So we, in order to do our assessment, um, we collect water samples and these um, circle cross these circles represent areas that we have 
that we collect our sampling from. They're, they're typically going to be at the deepest part of the lake near the spillways. Um, and it's going to be the same location year in and year out. Um, just as a side note, in this particular watershed, I mentioned we have Hooper Area Pond. Uh, it does have a sampling point as well where, where data was collected that we were able to use in our analysis. Typically, we just have one, one lake per watershed with sampling points, but in this instance, instance we, had, we had two. Um, so we get out on our boat and go to our sampling point. We, we draw the water samples um, and then send them back to the lab for analysis. And we're looking in those analysis, we're looking for phosphorus and nitrogen, basically what's the chemical composition of the, of the lake, um, chlorophyll, uh, which is uh, represented, uh, representative of algae in, in the lake, dissolved oxygen, E. coli, uh, it goes on, uh, things that are sampled for. Another, um, Thing that we're interested in is, is water clarity. So sometimes you can look at a lake and it has that, that real green tint, which would indicate some algae, or it might look more brownish, uh, reddish, which is uh, turbidity, which is associated with um, sediments suspended in, within the lake itself. So one way we measure clarity is through this device called a Secchi disk. And that Secchi disk is roughly uh, 30 centimeters in diameter. And it's painted uh, in alternating quadrants, black and white. And it's tied to a, um, a tape measure so that you can um, um, measure the depth of this Secchi depth. So we lower this Secchi depth into the water until we reach a point that we can no longer see it. And then we mark. Uh, what the reading is on the tape measure, and then that becomes our what we call our Secchi depth. Um, and just as a comparison, uh, the average Secchi depth for Lake Aquabi is 0.6 meters or two feet, while up in East Okaboji Lake, the a average Secchi depth is closer to six feet. So we do have some, obviously, some differences here between the two lakes where there's not as much uh, clarity as an issue with, within Lake Aquabi. Okay. All right, so once, once we have gathered the data, we want to be able to, to plot it. But first of all, before we get into the plot, here's, here's kind of a general plot. Um, we're gonna plot our years on the x-axis and we're gonna plot this value, which is called a TSI value or a trophic state index on our y-axis. And the trophic state index is um, a classification system, basically to determine a biological activity of, of a water body. The, the higher the TSI value, the more biological activity um, that we, we have, and the lower is obviously the uh, would be the opposite, uh, less biological activity. The objective and goal is to keep every, th all these TSI values below uh, this value of 65. And, and uh, we're gonna plot uh, chlorophyll, phosphorus, and our Secchi depth on this graph. So going on to the, the next, next slide, we can see that we have plotted um, our, our, our TSI Secchi depths, phosphorus, and chlorophyll. Now I'm gonna add that I've added one additional line here that I didn't talk about or have not presented before is this blue line. Um, what happens is that when we get above, like we see here, these green lines, our chlorophyll is above 65, which resulted in the water body being placed on the impaired waters list. And we can see that the trend for it is, is up and up. And then over time, it drops below that, that TSI value of 65. However, we want to 
plot this out and continue to analyze it over an extended period of time um, and with the intent that we get below a value of 63. But once we're below a value of 63, then we can remove it from the impaired waters list, but we need some uh, extended sampling, uh, a period of time of sampling to show that it's not going to keep going up and down, up and down, up and down above that red line. Um, and so that's what the blue line represents is, is uh, a value for removing it off the impaired waters list. Um, So what, what is a TMDL? And, and Jeff explained this to some degree. It's that tipping point, you know, what point can the lake not function as intended? Um, another way of describing it is, is how much a pollutant can a water body handle or assimilate and still meet water quality standards? So as we look at what a TMDL is, we're going to look at four different um, classifications categories. What first is our target. What is what is the pollutant that we're trying to target? Then uh, sources. What what are the sources of the pollutant? And then we're going to actually look at the TMDL um, from a math standpoint. What is the actual TMDL number? So we have an equation for that. And then the last thing is um, what where is the uh, pollutant actually being generated? Who's, who's generating it most uh, from a land use standpoint? So in this case, our target is, is phosphorus. Um, excess uh, phosphorus results in algae. It uh, can also be attached to sediment, which causes um, problems with, with clarity. Uh, phosphorus is transported by surface runoff and groundwater flow. So the intent of what we want to do is to reduce sediment from runoff into the lake. There are two basic uh, sources of, of pollutants. One of them is a, is a point source and the other is a non-point source. And Jeff touched on that briefly in the introduction, but point sources are things that require a permit. That would be like a, a wastewater treatment plant discharge, whether it's a publicly owned or a privately owned uh, system. Now in this particular watershed of Lake Aquabi, um, I'm sorry, we have no point sources. There's no wastewater treatment plant discharges uh, or anything like it. There's no permitted discharges within this particular watershed. So in our analysis, we, we, have, we don't even need to consider these point sources. The other source is our non-point sources, and that would be anything else, anything that's not requires a permit. That would be uh, runoff, um, direct deposition of manure and streams from animals, uh, urban runoff, failing septic tanks, and uh, several others here on the list that contribute uh, to, to the impairment. All right, so our target is phosphorus. Uh, we don't, and our sources are non-point sources since we have no point sources within the watershed. The next thing is we want to look at the math of how we determine what our TMDL is. And, and the, simply the equation is the total maximum day D load is equal to the summation of our waste load allocations plus the summation of our load allocations and a margin of safety. Now the waste load, <clears throat> the waste load allocations are equivalent to a point source where our load allocations are equivalent to our non-point sources. And a margin of safety we've included to account for any, any discharges that we haven't considered or that uh, might come up in the future. But that's our equation. 
for determining our, our total maximum daily load. Now, if we look at um, Lake Aquabi, we have determined that our total maximum daily load is 2,731 pounds of total phosphorus per year. Um, and we, right off the top, we're going to take 10% of that as our margin of safety. And since we have no waste load allocations or no, not, or no waste load allocations or point sources, then the, what the balance is going to be um, what our load allocation is or our non-point source, which is 2,458 pounds of total phosphorus per year. Now, if we want to look at that again in uh, terms of, of reductions, we see that what our existing load is, is 4,598 pounds of phosphorus coming into Lake Aquabi per year. However, the allowable or the total maximum daily load is uh, 2,731, which would result in a reduction of 41% of that we need to achieve in order to uh, bring the water quality into compliance with water quality standards. Now the next thing that we look at is where are the um, main contributors for, for this pollutant. And we just put that up in a circle chart and we can see that 52% uh, of the total phosphorus coming into Lake Aquabi is generated in row crop with 24% in forest land um, and the other 9% other and 9% from our grasslands and there's kind of a disproportionate amount uh, coming from row crops in this particular watershed at 52% where it only had 20 uh, if I remember right 27% of the uh, land use attributed So now we've looked through uh, our TMDL. We know basically, we, we know what our, our target is, we, uh, our, our load is, we know what we're trying to reduce, we know where it's coming from. Uh, now we want to put together some kind of an imp implementation plan. You know, what can we do moving forward to help improve the situation? And this implementation, impl implementation plan could include uh, possible solutions, solutions such as best management practices. Um, it would encourage local participation and obviously allows for uh, future monitoring to uh, measure the, the success of those practices that, ha that are put into place. So I'm going to look at some best management practices. Um, there are three categories for uh, best management practices. And the first one is um, land management prevention, basically uh, keeping the pollutant at the source, not allowing it to get uh, out of the, out, out away from its, uh, just keeping it at its source is what we want to try to do. And some examples of this would be uh, conservation till or no-till practices, cover crops, uh, are, are just a couple of examples. And just picking out a, one of the examples, a no-till farming, we can see here um, the soybean crop uh, planted over last year's corn crop. By doing this, um, we're not disturbing the soil, keeps it in a tight matrix. Um, which reduces erosion and leaving crop residue helps prevent and then prevents erosion and improves soil health and increases organic matter into the soil. So that's, that's just one example of, of this particular management practice. The next management practice, best management practice would be like a structural mitigate, mitigation is what how do we prevent the pollutant once it leaves the site? You know, we want to intercept or trap it before it gets to, in this case, Lake Aquabi. 
And some examples of that would be a riparian buffer strip or a saturated buffer strip, a grass waterway, a sedimentation basin. Remember how we talked about uh, the steep slopes and uh, how you pick up energy and speed as you go downhill unless there is a mechanism to slow you down, like in your car you brake. Well, these, these particular examples or, or methods are the brake that um, reduce the energy of the water as it goes downhill. A sedimentation basin, again, you know, if you've got water coming down here at uh, a lot of energy, high velocity, well, it hits, hits the sedimentation basin. It causes it to break, it slows down, it reduces the energy, and as it does that, it deposits the, the sediments and they settle to the bottom, allowing uh, the clear water to flow over a, a weir to go on into uh, Lake Aquabi. <clears throat> As I mentioned, this particular um, watershed has, I, you know, like I said, I counted 51 sedimentation basin farm ponds, which all could help uh, reduce the sediment coming to uh, Lake Aquabi. The third, third one is in lake remediation you know, fixing the issues in the lake once that pollutant reaches Lake Aquabi. Examples of this could be fisheries management or targeted dredging. With, with the fisheries management, um, you've got uh, particular types of fish that, like a grass carp, that consume aquatic plants that stir up the sediment at the bottom and allow that sediment and the phosphorus attached to it to be resuspended and become um, available for use to produce algae. With, with uh, grass carp consuming aquatic plants, uh, the aquatic plants also consume the phosphorus, but if there's no aquatic plants, then that they don't use the phosphorus, which again leaves it available for um, for algae production. And one, one, another example is targeted dredging, you know, removing the sediment from the lake, the, from the bottom. Um, these, these sedimentation basins have a design life of probably 50 years and where if they were constructed in the, in the 90s, we're into year 30 of it. So these sedimentation basins could potentially be at the end of their useful life and doing an analysis and determining uh, how much they've been silted in at this point could be beneficial to helping improve water quality at, in Lake Aquabi. So our next steps then after, uh, after all this would be to continue monitoring to see again how the practices put in place are performing to see if we're achieving our, our goals of improved water quality, um, to encourage locally led efforts, um, people that live in the watershed and, and play in the watershed uh, have, have an invested interest in, in seeing that improved. And also the last thing is where, where possible, uh, depending on resources, the DNR uh, can be um, helpful as a, as a technical resource in, in putting together uh, future plans and more specific plans to improve water quality. So with that said, thank you for uh, listening to this presentation. I hope you found it useful. If you have any questions or comments, please send them to myself or Jeff at the emails and uh, below or call us at the numbers listed. And again, thank you very much.